two men came out of the station rolling a covered object. They rolled it along the platform until they reached the middle of the train, then grunted as they lifted it up the steps, the sweat running down their bodies. One of its wheels fell off and bounced down the metal steps, and a man coming up behind them picked it up and handed it to the man who was wearing a rumpled brown suit. Thanks, said the man in the brown suit, and he put the wheel in his side coat pocket. Inside the car, the men pushed the covered object down the aisle. With one of its wheels off, it was lopsided, and the man in the brown suit, his name was Kelly, had to keep his shoulder braced against it to keep it from toppling over. He breathed heavily and licked away tiny balls of sweat that kept forming over his upper lip. When they reached the middle of the car, the man in the wrinkled blue suit pushed forward one of the seat backs, so there were four seats, two facing them. Then the two men pushed the covered object between the seats, and Kelly reached through a slit in the covering and felt around until he found the right button. The covered object sat down heavily on a seat by the window. Oh, God! Listen to him squeak, said Kelly. The other man, Paul, shrugged and sat down with a sigh. What do you expect? he asked. Kelly was pulling off his suit coat. He dropped it down on the opposite seat and sat down beside the covered object. Well, well, we'll get him some o' oh, that stuff soon's we're paid off, he said worriedly. If we can find some, said Pole, who was almost as thin as one. He sat slumped back against the hot seat, watching Kelly mop at his sweaty cheeks. Why shouldn't we? asked Kelly, pushing the damp ham handkerchief down under his shirt collar. Because they don't make it no more, Pole said with the same false patience of a man who had to say the same thing too many times. Well, that's crazy, said Kelly. He pulled off his hat and patted at the bald spot in the center of his rust-colored hair. There's still plenty B2s in the business. Not many, said Pole, bracing one foot upon the covered object. Don't, said Kelly. Pole let his foot drop heavily, and a curse fell slowly from his lips. Kelly ran the handkerchief around the lining of his hat. He started to put the hat on again, then changed his mind and dropped it on top of his coat. Christ, it's hot, he said. It'll get hotter, said Pole. Across the aisle, a man put his suitcase up on the rack, took off his suit coat, and sat down, puffing. Kelly looked at him, then turned back. "'You think it'll be hotter in Maynard, huh?' he asked. Paul nodded. Kelly swallowed dryly. "'Wish we could have another of them beers,' he said. Paul stared out the window at the heat waves rising on the concrete platform. "'I had three beers,' said Kelly, "'and I'm just as thirsty as I was when I started.' "'Yeah,' said Paul. "'Might as well have not had a beer since Philly,' said Kelly." Pole said, yeah. Kelly sat there staring at Pole a moment. Pole had dark hair and white skin, and his hands were the hands of a man who should be bigger than Pole was. But the hands were as clever as they were big. Pole's one of the best, Kelly thought. One of the best. You think he'll be all right, he asked. Pole grunted and smiled for an instant without being amused. If he don't get hit, he said. No, no, I mean it, said Kelly. Pole's dark, lifeless eyes left the station and shifted over to Kelly. So do I, he said. Come on, Kelly said. Steel, said Pole. Y you know, just as well as me. He's shot the hell. That ain't true, said Kelly, shifting uncomfortably. All he needs is a little work, a little overhaul, and he'll be as good as new. Yeah, a, a little three, four grand overhaul, Paul, Paul said. With pots they don't make no more. He looked out the window again. Oh, it ain't as bad as that, said Kelly. Jesus, the way you talk, you'd think he was ready for scrap. Ain't he, Paul asked. No, said Kelly angrily. He ain't. Paul shrugged, and his long white fingers rose and fell in his lap. Just because he's a little old, said Kelly. Old, Paul grunted. Ancient. Oh, Kelly took a deep breath of the hot air in the car and blew it out through his broad nose. 
He looked at the covered object like a father who was angry with his son's fault, but angrier with those who mentioned the faults of his son. Plenty of fight left in him, he said. Pole watched the people walking on the platform. He watched a porter pushing a wagon full of piled suitcases. Well, is he okay? Kelly asked finally as if he hated to ask. Pole looked over at him. I don't know, Steele, he said. He needs work. You know that. The trigger spring in his left arm's been rewired so many damn times it's almost shot. He's got no protection on that side. The left side of his face is all beat in. The eye lens is cracked. The leg cables is worn. They're, they're, they're pulled slack. The tension's gone to hell. Christ, even his gyro's off. Paul looked out at the platform again with a disgusted hiss. Not to mention the oil pastes he ain't gotten him, he said. We'll get him some, Kelly said. Yeah, after the fight? After the fight! Paul snapped. What about before the fight? He'll be cracking around the ring like a goddamn steam shovel. It'll be a miracle if he goes two rounds. They'll probably ride us out on a rail. Kelly swallowed. I don't think it's that bad, he said. The hell it ain't, said Paul. It's worse. Wait till that crowd gets a load of battling Maxo from Philadelphia. Oh, Christ. They'll blow a nut. We'll be lucky if we get our 500 bucks. Well, the contract's signed, said Kelly firmly. They can't back out now. I got a copy right in the old pocket. He leaned over and patted at his coat. That contract's for battling Maxo, said Paul. Not for this steam shovel here. Maxo's gonna do all right, said Kelly, as if he was trying hard to believe it. He's not as bad off as you say. Against a B-7, Paul asked. It's just a starter B-7, said Kelly. It ain't got the kinks out yet. Paul turned away. Battling Maxo, he said. One round Maxo. The battling steam shovel. Oh, shut the hell up, Kelly snapped suddenly, getting redder. You're always knocking him down. Well, he's been doing okay for 12 years now, and he'll keep on doing okay. So he needs some oil paste, and he needs a little work. So what? With 500 bucks, we can get him all the paste he needs. And a new trigger spring for his arm. And and new leg cables. And everything. Christ's sake. He fell back against the seat, chest shuddering with breath, and rubbed at his cheeks with his wet handkerchief. He looked aside at Maxo. Abruptly, he reached over a hand and patted Maxo's covered knee clumsily, and the steel clanked hollowly under his touch. Y you're doing all right, said Kelly to his fighter. The train was moving across a sun-baked prairie. All the windows were open, but the wind that blew in was like blasts from an oven. Kelly sat reading his paper, his shirt sticking wetly to his broad chest. Paul had taken his coat off, too, and was staring morosely out the window at the grass-tufted prairie that went as far as he could see. Maxo sat under his covering, his heavy steel frame rocking a little with the motion of the train. Kelly put down his paper. Not even a word, he said. Well, what do you expect, Paul asked. They don't cover Maynard. Maxo ain't just some clunk from Maynard, said Kelly. He was big time. You think they'd... He shrugged. Remember him. Why? For a couple of prelims in the garden three years ago, Paul asked. It wasn't no three years, buddy, said Kelly. It was in 1994, said Paul. And now it's 1997? That's three years where I come from. It was late 94, said Kelly, right before Christmas. Don't you remember? Just before... Marge and me. Kelly didn't finish. He stared down at the paper as if Marge's picture were on it, the way she looked the day she left him. What's the difference, Paul asked. They don't remember them, for Christ's sake. With a couple of thousand of the damn things floating around, how could they remember them? Uh, about the only ones who get space are the champions and the new models. Paul looked at Maxo. I hear Marlin's putting out a B9 this year, he said. Kelly refocused his eyes. Yeah, he said uninterestedly. Hyper triggers in both arms and legs. All steeled aluminum. Triple gyro. Triple twisted wiring. God, they'll be beautiful. Kelly put down the paper. 
think they'd remember him, he muttered. It wasn't so long ago. His face relaxed a smile of recollection. Boy, will I ever forget that night, he said. No one gives us a tumble. It, w it was all Dimsy the Rock, Dimsy the Rock. Three to one for Dimsy the Rock, Dimsy the Rock. Fourth rank in lightweight on his way to the top. He chuckled deep in his chest. And did we ever put him away, he said. Ooh, he grunted with savage pleasure. I can see that left cross now. Bang, right in the chops. And old Dimsy the Rock hitting the canvas like... Like a rock. Yeah, just like a rock. He laughed happily. Boy, what a night. What a night, he said. Will I ever forget that night? Pole looked at Kelly with a somber face. Then he turned away and stared at the dusty, sun-baked plain again. I wonder, he muttered. Kelly saw the man across the aisle looking again at the covered Maxo. He caught the man's eye and smiled, then gestured with his head toward Maxo. That's my fighter, he said loudly. The man smiled politely, cupping a hand behind one ear. My fighter, said Kelly. Badly Maxo. Ever heard of him? The man stared at Kelly for a moment before shaking his head. Kelly smiled. Yeah, he he was almost light heavyweight champ once, he told the man. The man nodded politely. On an impulse, Kelly got up and stepped across the aisle. He reversed the setback in front of the old man and sat down facing him. Pretty damn hot, he said. The man smiled. Yes, yes it is, he said. No new trains out here yet, huh? No, said the man, not yet. Got all the new ones back in Philly, said Kelly. That, that's where, he gestured with his head, my friend and I come from, and Maxo. Kelly stuck out his hand. The name's Kelly, he said. Tim Kelly. The man looked up, surprised. His grip was loose. Maxwell, he said. When he drew back his hand, he rubbed it unobtrusively on his pants. I used to be called Steel Kelly, said Kelly. Used to be in the business myself. Before the war, of course, I was a light heavy. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Called me Steel because I never got knocked down once. Not once. I was even number nine in the ranks once. Yeah. I see. The man waited patiently. My fighter, said Kelly, gesturing towards Maxo with his head again. He's a light heavy, too. We're fighting in Maynard tonight. You, you going that far? Ah, uh, no, said the man. Now I'm getting off at Hayes. Oh, Kelly nodded. Too bad. Gonna be a scrap. A good scrap. He let out a heavy breath. Yeah, he was fourth in the ranks once. He'll be back, too. He, uh... Knocked down Timsey the Rock in late 94. Maybe you read about that? I don't believe. Oh, uh-huh. Kelly nodded. Well, it was in all the East Coast papers, you know. New York, Boston, Philly. <laughs> yeah, it, it got a hell of a spread. Biggest upset of the year. He scratched at his bald spot. He's a B2, you know. That means he's the second... Model Mauling put out, he explained, seeing the look on the man's face. That was back in, let's see, uh, 90. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, 90. He made a smacking sound with his lips. Yeah, that was a good model, he said. The best. Maxo's still going strong. He shrugged depreciatingly. I don't go for these new ones, he said. You know, you know the ones made of steel aluminum with all the doodads. The man stared at Kelly blankly. Too flashy, flimsy. Nothing. Kelly bunched his big fists in front of his chest and made a face. Nothing solid, he said. No, Marlins don't make them like Maxo no more. I see, said the man. Kelly smiled. Yeah, he said. Used to be in the game myself. When there was enough men, of course, uh, before the bands, he shook his head, then smiled quickly. Well, he said, well, take this B-7. Don't even know what his name is, he said, laughing. His face sobered for an instant, and he swallowed. We'll take him, he said. Later on, when the man had gotten off the train, Kelly went back to his seat. He put his feet up on the opposite seat, and laying back in his head, he covered his face with a newspaper. Get a little shut-eye, he said. Pole grunted. Kelly sat slouched back, staring at the newspaper next to his eyes. 
He felt Maxo bumping against his side a little. He listened to the squeaking of Maxo's joints. Be all right, he muttered to himself. What? Kelly swallowed. I didn't say anything, he said. When they got off the train at six o'clock that evening, they pushed Maxo around the station and onto the sidewalk. Across the street from them, a man sitting in his taxi called them. We got no taxi money, said Paul. We can just push him through the streets, Kelly said. Besides, we don't even know where Kruger Stadium is. What are we supposed to eat with then? We'll be loaded after the fight, said Kelly. I'll buy you a steak three inches thick. Sighing, Paul helped Kelly push the heavy Maxo across the street that was still so hot they could feel it through their shoes. Kelly started sweating right away and licking at his upper lip. God, how'd they live out here, he asked. When they were putting Maxo inside the cab, the base wheel came out again, and Paul, with a snarl, kicked it away. What are, what are you doing? Kelly asked. Oh, sh Paul got into the taxi and slumped back against the warm leather of the seat, while Kelly hurried over the soft tar pavement and picked up the wheel. Christ's sake! Kelly muttered as he got in the cab. What's the... Where to, chief? the driver asked. Cougar Stadium, Kelly said. You're there! The cab driver pushed in the rotor button and the car glided away from the curb. What the hell's wrong with you? Kelly asked Paul in a low voice. We wait more than a half a damn year to get us about, and you've been nothing but belly aches from the start. Some bout, said Paul. Maynard, Kansas, the prize fighting center of the nation? It's a start, ain't it? Kelly said. It'll keep us in coffee and cakes a while, won't it? It'll put Maxo back in shape, and if we take it, it could lead to... Paul glanced over disgustedly. I don't get you, Kelly said quietly. He's our fighter. What are you writing him off for? D don't you want him to win? I'm a class A mechanic, Steele, Paul said in a falsely patient voice. I'm not a dr daydreaming kid. We got a piece of dead iron here, not a B7. It's simple mechanic, Steele, that's all. Max will be lucky if he comes out of that ring with his head still on. Kelly turned away angrily. It's a starter B7, he muttered. Full of kinks, full of them. Sure, sure, said Paul. They sat silently a while, looking out the window. Maxo between them. The broad steel shoulders bumping against theirs. Kelly stared at the building, his hands clenching and unclenching in his lap as if he were getting ready to go 15 rounds. That a B fighter you got there, the driver asked over his shoulder. Kelly started and looked forward. He managed to smile. That's right, he said. Fight night? Yeah, a b battling Maxo, maybe you heard of him? Nope. He was almost light heavyweight champion once, said Kelly. That right. Yes, sir. Y you heard of uh, old Dimsy the Rock, ain't you? Don't think so. Well, Dimsy the... Kelly stopped and glanced over at Pole, who was shifting irritably on the seat. Dimsy the Rock was number three in the light heavyweight ranks. Right on his way to the top, they all said. Well, my boy put him away in the fourth round, left crossed him, bang, almost put Dimsy through the ropes. It was beautiful. That right? asked the driver. Yes, sir. You get a chance to stop by tonight, and at the stadium, you'll see a good fight. Have you seen this Maynard Flash? Paul asked the driver suddenly. The Flash? You bet. Man, there's a fighter on his way. One seven straight. He'll be up there soon, you can bet your life. Matter of fact, he's fighting tonight, too. With some B2 heap from back east, I hear. The driver snickered. Flash will slaughter him, he said. Kelly stared at the back of the driver's head, the skin tight across his cheekbones. Yeah, he said flatly. Man, he'll... The bri driver broke off suddenly and looked back. Hey, you ain't. He started, then turned front again. Hey, I, I didn't know, mister, he said. I was only ribbon. Skip it, Paul said. You're right. Kelly's head snapped around, and he glared at the sallow face, Paul. Shut up, he said in a low voice. He fell back against the seat and star stared out the window, his face hard. I'm going to get, get him some oil paste, he said after they'd ridden a block. Swell, said Paul. He'll eat, we'll eat the tools. 
Go to hell, said Kelly. The cab pulled up in front of the brick-fronted stadium, and they lifted Maxo out onto the sidewalk, while Pole tilted him. Kelly squatted down and slid the base wheel back into its slot. Then Pe Kelly played the driver, the exact fare, and they started pushing Maxo towards the alley. Look, said Kelly, nodding towards the poster board in front of the stadium. The third fight listed was Maynard Flash, B7, LH, verse Battling Maxo, B2, LH. Big deal, said Paul. Kelly's smile disappeared. He started to say something, then pressed his lips together. He shook his head irritably, and big drops of his sweat fell to the sidewalk. Maxo creaked as they pushed him down the alley and carried him up the steps to the door. The base wheel fell out again and bounced down the cement steps. Neither one of them said anything. It was hotter inside. The air didn't move. Refreshing like a closet, Paul said. Get the wheel, Kelly said, and they started down the narrow hallway, leaving Paul with Maxo. Paul leaned Maxo uh, against the wall and turned for the door. Kelly came to a half-glassed office door and knocked. Yeah, said a voice inside. Kelly went in, taking off his hat. The fat, bald man looked up from his desk. His skull glistened with sweat. I'm battling Maxo's owner, said Kelly, smiling. He extended his big hand, but the man ignored it. Was wondering if you'd make it, said the man whose name was Mr. Watto. Your fighter in decent shape? The best, said Kelly cheerfully. The best, my, my machine, he's class A. Just took him apart and put him together before we left Philly. The man looked unconvinced. He, he's in good shape, said Kelly. You're lucky to get about with a B-2, said Mr. Watto. We ain't used nothing less than B-4s for more than two years now. The fighter we was after got stuck in a car wreck, uh, though, and got ruined. Kelly nodded. Well, you ain't got nothing to worry about, he said. My fighter's in top shape. He's the one knocked down Dimsy the Rock in Madison Square a year, year or so ago. I want a good fight, said the fat man. You'll get a good fight, Kelly said, feeling a tight pain in his stomach muscles. Maxo's in good shape, you'll see. He's in top shape. I just want a good fight. Kelly stared at the fat man for a moment. Then he said, You got a ready room we can use? The mechanic and me'd like to get something to eat. Third door, down the hall, on the right side, said Mr. Waddo. Your bout's at 8.30. Kelly nodded. Okay. Be there said Mr. Watto, turning back to his work. Uh, what about... Kelly started. Y y you get the money after you deliver a fight, Mr. Watto cut him off. Kelly's face faltered. Okay, he said. See you then. When Mr. Watto didn't answer, he turned for the door. Don't slam the door, Mr. Watto said. Kelly didn't. Come on, he said to Paul when he was in the hall again. They pushed Maxo down to the ready room and put him inside it. What about checking him over? What about my gut, snapped Paul. I ain't eaten in six hours. Kelly blew out a heavy breath. All right, let's go then. They put Maxo in the corner of the room. We should be able to lock him in, Kelly said. Why? You think somebody's going to steal him? He's valuable, said Kelly. Sure, he's a priceless antique, said Paul. Kelly closed the door three times before the latch caught. He turned away from it, shaking his head worriedly. As they started down the hall, he looked at his wrist and saw for the fifteenth time the white band where the, his pawn watch had been. What time is it, he asked. 6.25, said Paul. Well, we'll have to make it fast, Kelly said. I want you to check him over good before the fight. What for? asked Paul. Did you hear me? Kelly said angrily. Sure, sure, Paul said. He's going to take that son of a bitch B7, Kelly said, barely opening his lips. Sure he is, said Paul, with his teeth. Hurry up, Kelly said, ignoring him. We ain't got all night. Did you get the wheel? Paul handed it to him. Some town, Kelly said disgustedly as they came back in the side door of the stadium. 
I told you they wouldn't have any oil paste here, Paul said. Why should they? B-2s are dead. Max was probably the only one in a thousand miles. Kelly walked quickly down the hall, opened the door of the ready room, and went in. He crossed over to Maxo and pulled off the covering. Get to it, he said. There ain't much time. Blowing out a slow, tired breath, Paul took off his wrinkled blue coat and tossed it over the bench standing against the wall. He dragged a small table over to where Maxo was, then rolled up his sleeves. Kelly took off his hat and coat and watched while Paul loosed the nuts that held the tool cavity door shut. He stood with his big hands on his hips while Paul drew out the tools one by one and laid them down on the table. Rust, Paul muttered. He rubbed a finger around the inside of the cavity and held it up, copper-colored rust flaking off the tip. Come on, Kelly said irritably. He sat down on the bench and watched as Paul pried off the sectional plates on Maxo's chest. His eyes ran up over Maxo's leninin head. If I didn't see them co coils, he thought once more, I'd swear he was real. Only the mechanics in a bee fight could tell it wasn't real men in there. Sometimes people were actually fooled and sent in letters complaining that real men were being used. Even from ringside, the flesh tones looked human. Mauling had a special patent on that. Kelly's face relaxed as he smiled fondly at Maxo. Good boy, he muttered. Paul didn't hear. Kelly watched the sure-handed mechanic probe with his electric pick, examining connections and potency centers. Is he all right, he asked without thinking. Sure, he's great, Paul said. He plucked out a tiny steel cage tube. If this doesn't blow out, he said, why should it? Well, it's subpar, Paul said j jadedly. I told you that after the last, that last fight eight months ago. Kelly swallowed. We'll get him a new one after this bout, he said. Seventy-five bucks, muttered Paul, as if he were watching the money fly away on green wings. It'll hold, Kelly said, more to himself than to Paul. Paul shrugged. He put back the tube and pressed in the row of buttons on the ma main automatic board. Maxo stirred. Take it easy on the left arm, said Kelly. Save it. If it don't work here, it won't work out there, said Paul. He jabbed at a button, and Maxo's left arm began moving with little circling motions. Paul pushed over the safety block switch that would keep Maxo from counterpunching and stepping, stepped back. He threw a right at Maxo's chin, and the robot's arm jumped up with a hitching motion to cover his face. Maxo's left eye flickered like a ruby catching the sun. If that eye cell goes, Paul said, it won't, said Kelly tensely. He watched Paul throw another punch at the left side of Maxo's head. He saw the tiny ripple of the flexo-covered cheek. Then the arm jerked up again. It squeaked. That's enough, he said. It works. Try the rest of him. He's going to get more than two punches thrown at his head, Paul said. His arms? All right, Kelly said. Try something else, I said. Paul reached inside Maxo and activated the leg cable centers. Maxo began shifting around. He lifted his leg and shook off the base wheel automatically. Then he was standing lightly on his back shoed feet, feeling the floor like a cured cripple testing for stance. Paul reached forward and jabbed in the full button and jumped back as Maxo's eye beam centered on him and the robot moved forward, broad shoulders rocking slowly, arms up defensively. Christ, Paul muttered. They'll hear him squeaking in the back row. Kelly grimaced, teeth set. He watched Paul throw another right, and Maxo's arm lurched raggedly. His throat moved with a convulsive swallow, and he seemed to have trouble breathing the close air in the little room. Paul shifted around the floor quickly, side to side. Maxo followed lumberingly, changing direction with visible jerking motions. Oh... He's beautiful, Paul said, stopping. Just beautiful. Maxo came up, arms still raised, and Paul jabbing under them, pushing the off button. Maxo stopped. Look, we'll, we'll have to put him on defense, Steele, Paul said. That's all there is to it. He'll get chopped to pieces if we have him moving in. Clelly cleared his throat. No, he said. Oh, for... Will you, will you use your head, snapped Paul. He's a B2, for Christ's sake. He's going to get slaughtered anyway. Let's save the pieces. 
They want him on the offense, said Kelly. It's in the contract. Paul turned away with a hiss. What's the use, he muttered. Test him some more. What for? He's as good as he'll ever be. Will you do what I say? Kelly shouted, all the tension exploding out of him. Paul turned back and jabbed in a button. Maxo's left arm shot out. There was a snapping noise inside it, and it fell against Maxo's side with a dead clank. Kelly started up, his face stricken. Jesus, what did you do? he cried. He ran over to where Paul was, pushing the button again. Maxo's arm didn't move. I told you not to fool with that arm, Kelly yelled. What the hell's the matter with you? His voice cracked in the middle of the sentence. Paul didn't answer. He picked up his pry and began working off the left shoulder plate. So help me God, if you broke that arm, Kelly warned in a low, shaking voice. If I broke it, Paul snapped. Listen, you dumb mick. This heap's been running on borrowed time for three years now. Don't talk to me about breakages. Kelly clenched his teeth, his eyes small and deadly. Open it up, he said. Son of a... Paul muttered as he got the plate off. You find another goddamn mechanic that could keep this steam shovel together any better these last years. You just find one. Kelly didn't answer. He stood rigidly, watching while Paul put down the curved plate and looked inside. When Paul touched it, the trigger spring broke in half, and part of it jumped across the room. Kelly stared at the shoulder pit with horrified eyes. Oh, Christ, he said in a shaking voice. Oh, Christ. Paul started to say something, then stopped. He looked at the ashen fake Kelly without moving. Kelly's eyes moved to Paul. Fix it, he said hoarsely. Paul swallowed. Steel, I... Fix it! I can't. That spring's been fixing to break for... You broke it! Now fix it! Kelly clamped rigid fingers on Paul's arms. Paul jerked back. Let go of me! What's the matter with you? Kelly cried. Are you crazy? He's gotta be fixed! He's gotta be... Steel, he needs a new spring. We'll get it. They don't have him here, Steel, Paul said. I told you, and if they did have him, we ain't got sixty... Sixteen fifty to get one. Oh, oh, Jesus, said Kelly. His hand fell away, and he stumbled to the other side of the room. He sank down on the bench and stared without blinking at the tall, motionless Maxo. He sat there a long time, just staring, while Paul stood watching him, the prize still in his hand. He saw Kelly's broad chest rise and fall with spasmodic movements. Kelly's face was a blank. If he don't watch him, muttered Kelly, finally. What? Kelly looked up, his mouth set in, in a straight, hard line. If he don't watch, it'll work, he said. What are you talking about? Kelly stood up and, and started unbuttoning his shirt. W what are you... Paul stopped dead, his mouth falling open. Are you crazy, he asked. Kelly kept unbuttoning his shirt. He pulled it off and tossed it on the bench. Steel, you're out of your mind, Paul said. You can't do that. Kelly didn't say anything. But you'll... Steel, you're crazy. We deliver a fight or we don't get paid, Kelly said. But Jesus, you'll get killed. Kelly pulled off his undershirt. His chest was beefy. There was red hair swirled around it. You have to shave this off, he said. Steel, come on. Paul said, you, his eyes widened as Kelly sat down on the bench and started unlacing his shoes. They'll never let you, Paul said. You can't make him think you're a... He stopped and took a jerky step forward. Steel, for Christ's sake. Kelly looked up at Paul with dead eyes. You'll help me, he said. But they... Nobody knows what Maxo looks like, Kelly said. And only Watto saw me. If he don't watch the bouts, we'll be all right. But they won't know, Kelly said. The bees bleed and bruise, too. Steel, come on, Paul said shakily. He took a deep breath and calmed himself. He sat down hurriedly beside the broad-shouldered Irishman. L Look, he said. I, I got a sister back east, in Maryland. If I wire her, she'll send us the dough to get back. Kelly got up and unbuckled his belt. Steel. I know a guy in Philly with a B-5 wants to sell cheap, Paul said desperately. We, we could scurry up the cash and steal. For Christ's sakes, you'll get killed. It's a B-7. Don't you understand? A B-7, you'll be mangled. Kelly was working the dark trunks over Maxo's hips. 
I won't let you do it, Steele, Paul said. I'll, I'll go to... He broke off with a sucked-in gasp as Kelly whirled and moved over quickly to haul him to his feet. Kelly's grip was like the jaws of a trap, and there was nothing left of him in his eyes. You'll help me, Kelly said in a low, trembling voice. You'll help me, or I'll beat your brains out on the wall. You'll get killed, Paul murmured. Then I will, said Kelly. Mr. Watto came out of his office as Paul was walking the covered Kelly towards the ring. Come on, come on, Mr. Watto said. They're waiting on you. Paul nodded jerkily and guided Kelly down the hall. Where's the owner? Mr. Watto called after them. Paul, Paul swallowed quickly. In the audience, he said. Mr. Watto grunted, and as they walked on, Paul heard the door to the office close. Breath emptied from him. I should have told him, he muttered. I had oughta killed you, Kelly said, his voice muffled under the covering. Crowd sounds leaked back into the hall now as they turned a corner. Under the canvas covering, Kelly felt a drop of sweat trickle down his temple. Listen, he said, y you'll have to tell me off between rounds. Between what rounds, Paul said tensely. You won't even last one. Shut up. You think y you're just up against some tough fighter? Paul asked. You're up against a machine, don't you? I said, shut up. Oh, you dumb, Paul swallowed. If I tell you off, they'll know, he said. They ain't seen a B2 in years, Kelly broke in. If anyone asks, tell them it's an oil leak. Sure, said Paul disgustedly. He bit his lips. Steel, you'll never get away with it. The last part of his sentence was drowned out as suddenly they were among the crowd walking down the sloping aisle toward the ring. Kelly held his knees locked and walked a little stiffly. He drew in a long, deep breath and let it out slowly. He'd have to breathe in small gasps and exhalations through his nose while he was in the ring. The people couldn't see his chest moving or they'd know. The heat burned in around him like a hanging weight. It was like walking along the sloping floor of an ocean of heat and sound. He heard voices drifting past him as he moved. You'll take him home in a box! Well, if it ain't rattling Maxo and the inevitable scrap iron! Kelly swallowed dryly, feeling a tight drawing sensation in his loins. Thirsty, he thought. The momentary vision of the bar across from the Kansas City train station crossed his mind. The dim-lit booth, the cool fan breeze on his, the back of his neck, the icy sweat, beaded, bottle, chilling his palms. He swallowed again. He hadn't allowed himself one drink in the last hour. The less he drank, the less he'd have to sweat. He knew. Watch it. He felt Paul's hand slide in through the opening in the back of the covering, felt the mechanic's hand grab his arm and check. Ring steps, Paul said out of the corner of his mouth. Kelly edged his right foot forward until the shoe tip touched the riser of the bottom step. Then he lifted his foot to the step and started up. At the top, Paul's fingers tightened around his arm again. Ropes, Paul said guardedly. It was hard getting through the ropes with the covering on. Kelly almost fell, and hoots and catcalls came at him like spears out of the din. Kelly felt the canvas give slightly under his feet, and then Paul pushed the stool against the back of his leg, and he sat down a little too jerkily. Hey, get that Derek out of here, shouted a man in the second row. Laughter and hoots. Scrap iron, yelled some people. Then Paul drew off the covering and put it down on the ring apron. Kelly sat there, staring at the Maynard Flash. The B-7 was motionless, its gloved hands hanging across its legs. There was imitation blonde hair, crew-cut, growing out of its skull pores. Its face was that of an impressive Adonis. The simulation of muscle curve on its body and limbs was almost perfect. For a moment, Kelly almost thought that years had been peeled away and he was in the business again, facing a young contender. He swallowed carefully. Paul crouched beside him, pretending to fiddle with an arm plate. Steal. Don't, he muttered again. Kelly didn't answer. He felt a desperate desire to suck in a lungful of air and bellow his chest. 
He drew in small patches of air, though, through his nose and let them trickle out. He kept staring at the Maynard Flash, thinking of the array of instant reaction centers inside that smooth arch of chest. The drawing sensation reached his stomach. It was like a cold hand pulling in at strands of muscle and ligament. A red-faced man in a white suit climbed into the ring and reached up for the microphone, which was swinging down to him. Ladies and gentlemen, he announced, the opening bout of the evening, a ten-round light heavyweight bout, from Philadelphia the B2, battling Maxo. The crowd booed and hissed. They threw up paper airplanes and shouted, Scrap Iron! His opponent, our own B7, the Maynard Flash. Cheers and wild clapping. The Flash's mechanic touched a button under the left armpit, and the B-7 jumped up and held his arms over his head in the victory gesture. The crowd laughed happily. Jesus, Paul muttered. I never saw that. Must be a new gimmick. Kelly blinked to relieve his eyes. Three more bouts to follow, said the red-faced man, and then the microphone drew up and he left the ring. There was no referee. B-fighters never clinched. Their machinery rejected it, and there was no knockdown count. A felled B fighter stayed down. The new B9, it was claimed by the Mauline publicity staff, would be able to get up, which would make for livelier and longer bouts. Paul pretended to check over Kelly. Steal it, your last chance, he begged. Get out, said Kelly, without moving his lips. Paul looked at Kelly's immobile eyes a moment, then sucked in a ragged breath and straightened up. Stay away from him, he warned as he started through the ropes. Across the ring, the flash was standing in its corner, hitting its gloves together as if it were a real young fighter. Anxious to get the fight started, Kelly stood up and Paul drew the stool away. Kelly stood watching the B-7, seeing how its eye centers were zeroing in on him. There was a cold sinking in his stomach. The bell rang. The B-7 moved out smoothly from its corner with a mechanical glide. Its arms raised in the traditional way, gloved hands wa wavering in tiny circles in front of it. It moved quickly towards Kelly, who edged out of his corner um, automatically, his mind feeling abruptly frozen. He felt his own hands rise as if someone else had lifted them, and his legs were like dead wood under him. He kept his gaze on the bright, unmoving eyes of the Maynard Flash. They came together. The B-7's left flicked out, and Kelly blocked it, feeling the rock-hard fist of the Flash even through his glove. The fist moved out again. Kelly drew back his head and felt a warm breeze across his mouth. His own left shot out and banged against the Flash's nose. It was like hitting a doorknob. Pain flared in Kelly's arm, and his jaw muscles went hard as he struggled to keep his face blank. The B-7 fainted with the left, and Kelly knocked it aside. He couldn't stop the right that blurred in after it and grazed his left temple. He jerked his head away, and the B-7 threw a left that hit him over the air. Kelly lurched back, throwing out a left that the B-7 brushed aside. Kelly caught the footing and hit the Flash's jaw solidly with a right uppercut. He felt a jolt of pain run up his arm. The Flash's head didn't bulge. He shot out a left that hit Kelly on the right shoulder. Kelly backpedaled instinctively. Then he heard someone yell, Get him a bicycle! And he remembered what Mr. Watto had said. He moved in again, his lips aching. They were pressed together so tightly. A left caught him under the heart, and he felt the impact shudder through his frame. Pain stabbed at his heart. He threw a spasmatic left, which banged against the B-7's nose again. There was only pain. Kelly stepped back and staggered as a hard right caught him high on the chest. He started to move back. The B-7 hit him on the chest again. Kelly lost his balance and stepped back quickly to catch e equilibrium. The crowd booed. The B-7 moved in without making a single mechanical sound. Kelly regained his balance and stopped. He threw a hard right that missed. The momentum of his blow threw him off center, and the Flash's left drove hard against his upper right arm. The arm went numb. Even as Kelly was sucking in a teeth-clenched gasp, the B-7 shot in a hand right under the guard and slammed into Kelly's spongy stomach. Kelly felt the breath go out of him. 
His right slapped ineffectively across the Flash's right cheek. The Flash's eyes glinted. As the B-7 moved in again, Kelly sidestepped, and for a moment, the radial eye centers lost him. Kelly moved out of range dizzily, pulling air in through his nose. Get that heap out of here, some man screamed. Scrap iron, scrap iron. Breath shook in Chelly's throat. He swallowed quickly and started forward, just as the flash picked him up again. Taking a chance, he sucked in breath through his mouth, hoping that his movements would keep the people from seeing. Then he was up to the B-7. He stepped in close, hoping to out-time electrical impulse. He threw a hard right at the Flash's body. The B-7's left shot up, and Kelly's blow was deflected by the iron wrist. Kelly's left was thrown off too, and then the Flash's left shot in and drove the breath out of Kelly again. Kelly's left barely hit the Flash's rock-hard chest. He staggered back, the B-7 following. He, he kept jabbing, the, but the B-7 kept deflecting the blows and counter-jabbing with almost the same piston-like motion. Kelly's head kept snapping back. He fell back more and saw the right coming straight at him. He couldn't stop it. The blow drove in like a steel battering ram. Spears of pain shot behind Kelly's eyes and through his head. A black cloud seemed to flood across the ring. His muffled cry was drowned out by the screaming crowd as he toppled back, his nose and mouth trickling bright blood that looked as good as the dye they used in the bee fighters. The rope checked his fall. Pressing in rough and hard against his back, he swayed there, right arm hanging limp, left arm raised defensively. He blinked his eyes instinctively, trying to focus them. I'm a robot, he thought. A robot. The flash stepped in and drove a violent right into Kelly's chest, a left to his stomach. Kelly doubled over, gagging. A right slammed off his skull like a hammer blow, driving him back against the rope again. The crowd screamed. Kelly saw the blurred outline of the Maynard Flash. He felt another blow smash into his chest like a club. With a sob, he, he threw a wild left that the B-7 brushed off. Another sharp blow landed on Kelly's shoulder. He lifted his right and managed to deflect the worst of a left thrown at his jaw. Another right con concaved his stomach. He doubled over. A hammering right drove him back on the ropes. He felt hot sweaty blood in his mouth and the roar of the crowd seemed to swallow him stay up he screamed at himself stay up god damn you the ring wavered before him like dark water with a desperate surge of energy he threw a right as hard as he could at the tall beautiful figure in front of him something cracked in his wrist and hand and a wave of searing pain shot up his arm his throat locked cry went unheard. His arm fell, his left went down, and the crowd shrieked and howled for the flash to finish it. There was only inches between them now. The B-7 reined in blows that didn't miss. Kelly lurched and staggered on the, under the impact of them. His head snapped from side to side. Blood ran across his face in scarlet ribbons. His arm hung like a dead branch at his side. He kept getting slammed back against the ropes, bouncing forward and getting slammed back against. He couldn't see anymore. He could only hear the screaming of the crowd and the endless swishing and thudding of the B-7's gloves. Stay up, he thought. I have to stay up. He drew in his head and hunched his shoulders to protect himself. He was like that seven seconds before the bell when a clubbing right on the side of his head sent him crashing to the canvas. He lay there gasping for breath. Suddenly, he started to get up, then equally as suddenly realized that he couldn't. He fell forward again and lay on his stomach on the warm canvas, his head throbbing with pain. He could hear the booing and hissing of the dissatisfied crowd. When Pole finally managed to get him up and slip the cover over his head, the crowd was jeering so loudly that Kelly couldn't hear Pole's voice. He felt the mechanic's big hand inside the covering guiding him, but he fell down, climbing through the ropes, and almost fell again on the steps. His legs were like rubber tubes. Stay up, his brain still murmured the words. In the ready room, he collapsed. 
Claypool tried to get him up on the bench, but he couldn't. Finally, he bunched up his blue coat under Kelly's head, and kneeling, he started patting with his handkerchief at the trickles of blood. You dumb bastard, he kept muttering in a thin, shaking voice. You dumb bastard. Kelly lifted his hand and brushed away Pole's hand. Go get the money, he gasped hoarsely. What? The money, gasped Kelly through his teeth. But now, Kelly's voice was barely intelligible. Pole straightened up and stood looking down at Kelly a moment. Then he turned and went out. Kelly lay there, drawing in breath and exhaling it with wheezing sounds. He couldn't move his right hand, and he knew it was broken. He felt the blood trickling from his nose and mouth. His body throbbed with pain. After a few moments, he struggled up on his left elbow and turned his head, pain crackling along his neck muscles. When he saw that Maxo was all right, he put his head down again. A smile twisted up one corner of his lips. When Pole came back, Kelly lifted his head painfully. Pole came over and knelt down. He started patting at the blood again. You, you get it? Kelly asked in a crusty whisper. Pole blew out a slow breath. Well, Pole swallowed. Half of it, he said. Kelly stared up at him blankly, his mouth falling open. His eyes didn't believe it. He said he wouldn't pay five C's for a one-rounder. What do you mean? Kelly's voice cracked. He tried to get up and put down his right hand. With a strangled cry, he fell back, his face white. His head thrashed on the coat pillow, his eyes shut tightly. No, he moaned. No, 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 no. Pole was looking at his hand and wrist. Jesus, God he whispered. Kelly's eyes opened, and he stared up dizzily at the mechanic. He can't. He can't do that, he gasped. Paul licked his dry lips. Steel, there. There ain't a thing we can do. He's got a bunch of toughs in the office with him. I can't. He lowered his head. And if you was to go in there, he'd know what you'd done. And he might even take back the two and a half. Kelly lay on his back, staring up at the naked bulb without blinking. His chest labored and shuddered with breath. No, he murmured, no. He lay there for a long time without talking. Pole got some water and cleaned off his face and gave him a drink. He opened up his small suitcase and patched up Kelly's face. He put Kelly's right arm in a sling. Fifteen minutes later, Kelly spoke. We'll go back by bus, he said. What? Pole asked. We'll go back by bus, Kelly said slowly. That only cost, oh, fifty, sixty bucks. He swallowed and shifted on his back. That'll leave almost two C's. We can get him a new trigger spring and, and uh, eye lens and... He blinked his eyes and held them shut a moment as the room started fading again. An oil pace, he said then. Loads of it. He'll, he'll be good as new as again. Kelly looked up at Paul. Then we'll be all set up, he said. Max will be in good shape again, and we can get us some decent bouts. He swallowed and breathed laboriously. That's all he needs, a little work. New spring, uh, a new eye lens. That'll shape him up. We'll show those bastards what a B2 can do. Oh, Max will show them, right? Pole looked down at the big Irishman and sighed. Right, Steele. He said.